All right, now we're good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning to this week's Quantum Chaos Seminar. We had some slight technical difficulties, but all of those seem to be solved now. So this week, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker. So for those of you watching for the first time, please feel free to ask questions through the YouTube live chat, which we'll then post to the speaker. And you can ask questions either during the chat, during the talk, or at the end of the talk. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Garrett from the University of Oxford. So after doing his undergraduate at Cambridge University, Sam moved to Oxford, where he's currently a third year graduate student working with John Chalker. And today he'll be talking about his joint work about many body quantum chaos and the local pairing of Feynman histories. Take it away, Sam. Right, uh, thanks for the introduction and for inviting me to give the talk. Um, yeah, so this is some work of mine with uh, my supervisor, John Chalker. And I'd also like to acknowledge a lot of uh, useful, useful discussions we had along the way with Adam Nahum and uh, archive reference here. Um, right, so uh, I'm going to start, start this talk maybe slightly unconventionally, uh, telling you the kind of scheme of the talk and also maybe the, some of the results from the beginning. Um, so maybe that will be incomprehensible, but um, it's at least supposed to sound kind of interesting so you listen until the end. Okay, so we're going to be thinking about a kind of dynamics of random spin chains and the evolution operators describing these dynamics. Um, and so naturally we're interested in the spectral properties of these evolution operators, which I'll give more detail on in the next slide. Um, so our kind of main method of calculation is to express these spectral properties as sums over histories. And these histories are paths in the many body Fox space. Uh, so a common way to simplify this, these kind of sums, especially in random systems is the diagonal approximation. So we'll be talking about the diagonal approximation and importantly, how it has to be extended uh, when you're thinking about many body systems with local interactions. So yeah, in this case, we're thinking about nearest neighbor. Um, so later on in the talk, I'll show you how you can calculate some properties of these sums over histories using a kind of transfer matrix, which acts on the world lines of the spins. And our sort of key results are the following. So um, I'll show that even even in these random systems, there are devia significant deviations from random matrix behavior. And strikingly, these deviations actually grow without bound as you increase the system size. Um, and then also, which was kind of a surprise to us when, it, when we saw it, is that even in these most generic systems where you'd think that the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis would be most accurate, you actually have some pretty huge deviations from it. Okay, so first off, the model in detail. So as I mentioned, we're thinking about these uh, spin chains. So L site chain Q state spins, Q equals two here corresponds to spin half. Um, and the kind of dynamics we consider is circuit dynamics. So in this, uh, under time, uh, the time evolution is described by these Q squared by Q squared random matrices, which I've drawn here as these gray boxes. So here I'm showing one time step. So in the first half of the time step, you allow spins one and two to interact and three and four to interact and so on. And in the second half of the time step, you couple the alternate neighbors. And this kind of model was first conceived in the Floquet form, which I'll talk about, by uh, Amos Chen, Andrea De Luca, and John a few years ago now. So yeah, as I mentioned, we're thinking about Floquet dynamics, um, which is, so it's quench disorder. That is to say, um, we, in a given disorder realization, we pick a bunch of Q squared by Q squared random matrices to set to um, give us this W1 and W2 that I've defined above. And then that, those choices of random matrices for the different bonds are frozen for all time. So this means that our evolution for time T as I've shown down here is just given by powers of this Floquet operator, which is W2 multiplied by W1. Um, now what's quite nice about these models compared to say random Hamiltonian systems is that there are actually no conserved densities whatsoever. So we really do have uh, locality and not much else built into a model. And uh, in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, the spectral properties of these Floquet operators in the case of Q equals two or spin half. Um, okay, so the first thing I'll talk about are the spectra. Um, so I probably don't need to tell uh, the audience here that the spectra of chaotic quantum systems have um, certain universal properties. Um, so for example, at the smallest energy scales, we know that 
the statistical properties of the spectra basically just depend on whether or not your system has time reversal symmetry or not. Um, so in our case, the spectra we're thinking of are of those of the Floquet operator. Uh, so the eigenvalues of this Floquet operator being unitary are phasors, these e to pi, theta n, and uh, these theta n are the quasi energies. Now, um, a nice way to characterize the spectra of Floquet operators is the spectral form factor. So the spectral form factor, which I've defined here as a kind of average, um, tells us about two point correlations in the level density. Now, because in a Floquet system, your spectrum is kind of uh, invariant under rotations around the circle, it does make sense to look at Fourier components in this way. And also the spectral form factor has a very characteristic form for random matrices, which I've drawn below. So just to go over this in a bit more detail, um, if we're thinking about n by n Haar random unitary matrices, the spectral form factor, Kt, has this characteristic ramp regime for times less than n, and then a plateau beyond this. So beyond the plateau is probably a bit easier to understand. So when t is greater than n, you're really probing correlations in the level density on scales smaller than the nearest neighbor spacing. Um, sorry, the, average, the mean level spacing. Um, and once you get to scales like that, your trace of the evolution operator essentially looks like a sum over n random phasors. And so you expect that, that trace to be a complex number of met with magnitude of order root n. Squaring it and averaging, you find a spectral form factor equal to n. On um, er at earlier times, you have this ramp, which is really going to be our focus through the talk and is uh, slightly harder to understand, but hopefully you'll have a good idea of what's going on over the next few slides. Uh, so I should also say here that, um, okay, in our case, n is equal to q to the l, which is well, in the thermodynamic limit, huge. Um, and so when I say late times, I'm still thinking about times less than n. So when I say late time behavior, I mean late times, but times still less than q to the power of l. Right, so to understand this ramp, can uh, it's helpful. Ask, sure. Can I ask a quick question? So at time zero, I expect k of zero to equal dimension of your Hilbert space, but here it just seems to be to go to zero. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't. I, I avoided labeling um, the early time because I didn't want to put time zero in there. So time zero, yeah, the spectral form factor is n squared. Um, at time one, it's one, and time two, it's two, and so on. So you have a spike at the very earliest times, and um, yeah, so I guess those of you who are more familiar with Hamiltonian systems will be very familiar with this uh, peak in the spectral form factor at early times and a smooth decay down to a ramp and then a plateau. But in this Floquet system, that peak is really just at time zero. Thanks. Okay, yeah, so to understand the ramp, we should talk about the diagonal approximation. We are maybe familiar from semi-classical chaos and disordered conductors. So, um, this is sort of quantum mechanics 101. Um, uh, you can write the amplitude of, of evolving from a state A to a state B over time T as a sum over paths. So these are paths in a space of spin configurations in our case, which I've sketched here. So here I'm just drawing a single spin. So each of these is a different path. Its amplitude is some complex number, AP. Um, they all go from A to B. Uh, and this means that the probability is given by a sum over pairs of these paths. So uh, for the forward paths, um, I have amplitudes AP and the backward paths appearing in the conjugate of the amplitude, I have so AQ squared. And we can split this sum into diagonal terms and the off diagonal terms, which are called fluctuations here. So just to sketch schematically what I mean by one of these diagonal paths or diagonal pairings of paths, uh, I've, I've drawn one here. So endpoints the same as always, but now the intermediate spin configurations are the same too. Um, and basically the idea of the diagonal approximation is that in a uh, sort of chaotic quantum system, you might expect that the amplitudes associated with distinct paths might be, uh, might be completely uncorrelated. And then when you perform a suitable average over the prob probability to evolve from A to B, um, all of these fluctuations will go away. So after a suitable average, you just keep the diagonal terms. And this is really the essence of the diagonal approximation. Okay, so that's the probability. But if I want to talk about the spectrum, really I should start by talking about um, the trace of the evolution operator. 
So the trace uh, here is a sum over all closed paths or orbits with period t. And what's um, very important here is that the amplitude of an orbit doesn't depend on where it starts. Uh, and what this means is that we're going to have more diagonal terms when we take the modulus square. So if I take the mod square, I now have a sum over pairs of orbits or closed paths. And so I have a number of diagonal contributions. So what I've drawn here is that the sort of forward orbit, which I've drawn as the outer circle, is paired with backward orbits that can differ from it by cyclic permutations. Um, so on the, the left, leftmost diagram, I've sort of paired 12 o'clock of my forward orbit with um, 12 o'clock of the backward. In the second, I've paired 12 o'clock with two o'clock and so on. Um, and the fact that you have these t different pairings of orbits is, is a way of understanding how the spectral form factor comes out to be equal to t. Uh, are there any questions about this? People seem to be good so far. OK, great. Um, OK, so the diagonal approximation has a bit of a history. So um, in the sort of late 70s and into the early 80s, it was people were thinking about the uh, spectra of chaotic classical systems. So the, this the classic example here is billiards. Uh, and the idea is that once you, um, well, the idea here is, as I was saying before, you can express spectral properties in terms of well, path integrals in this case. And the idea is that once you, and once you get to late times, um, the paths that are entering your path integral have essentially spread over all of the space. In this case, we're thinking about phase space. So at late times, your paths spread over phase space. And then once they have, um, the details of the original system don't matter very much. So when you take the mod square of your path integral, and you're again worrying about pairs of these paths, um, the, the, uh, the sort of details of the original system don't matter anymore. And if you make the diagonal approximation, you will again find um, that you, only, you should only be pairing your forward orbits with those backward orbits that are related by uh, cyclic symmetry, just as I was showing here. Uh, and then the diagonal approximation also shows up in studies of disordered conductors. So there it's in these diffuson and Couperon diagrams, which govern the uh, long distance and low energy properties. More recently, um, the diagonal approximation has shown up in a few forms. So maybe I'll talk about the last one here first. So um, this is a lot of work by Klaus Richter's group. And there it's, it's really been um, a pretty honest adaptation of the ideas of Goodswill and Berry, but now to sort of many body bosonic systems, or uh, maybe I've seen a, fermi a fermionic paper or two, but I think mainly the emphasis was bosons there. Um, and then in the sort of quantum circuit community, where, um, well, okay, a lot, of the, a lot of the early work in quantum circuits focused on models where you didn't have any kind of time periodicity. So models very much like the one I showed before, but now where the gates are independently chosen at different time steps. So in a model like that, when you take an average, the averaging over the individual, the averaging over the gates will sort of glue the paths together all through space time. And so the diagonal approximation appears quite naturally. So really it's the average over disorder in random unitary circuits, which gives you the diagonal approximation. And then, um, well then what I'm gonna be talking about today is work on many body floquet problems. So there was this very nice work by um, Pavel Koss and collaborators a few years back, where they uh, applied the diagonal approximation to, the spec to calculate the spectral form factor of kicked spin chains. And there was some numerics in there that I think are very relevant to what I'm gonna be talking about today. So what they showed was that at late times, the diagonal approximation was really an excellent way to describe the spectral form factor. Um, but then for when you decrease the range of the interactions in their kicked spin chains, uh, the diagonal approximation became sort of less accurate at early times. And that's going to be really at the heart of what I'm talking about today. And then this uh, paper by Amos Chan, uh, Andre Luca, and John is where they introduced the model um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so yeah, I should say, I should say a bit about averaging because it does, maybe from what I've said so far, it sounds like you need a very sort of violent full ensemble average to get any behavior uh, related to the diagonal approximation. So what I've shown you here are three calculations of the same object with different degrees of averaging. So I'm focusing on one of my Floquet circuits now. 
uh, in the left-hand diagram, I've calculated the spectral form factor. So I've traced the evolution operator and taken the mod square and done no averaging whatsoever. And as you can see, the spectral form factor looks like kind of a mess. It doesn't look very much like teeth. Um, but then in the second panel, what I've done is I've averaged over just one of the one of the gates in the circuit. So everything else is completely random. One gate has been averaged, and we see basically the linear behavior. And this is to be compared with the full ensemble average, which I'm showing on the right. So I suppose the part of what I'm saying here is that uh, the amount of aver the averaging you need to do is enough averaging to wash out these fluctuation terms, enough averaging to wash out the off diagonal contribution to the spectral form factor. Okay. Um, so uh, from here on, it's really the heart of the talk. Um, the picture I'm going to be describing today is about pairing domains. So it's sort of the breakdown of the diagonal approximation, or at least a pretty serious modification to it that you have to make in many body systems with local interactions. So let's think about what the spectral form factor does uh, in, a, in such a system. So at early times, you can imagine that the system has not noticed that it's uh, a very long spin chain. At the very earliest times, you, the locality of interactions is going to make a difference. And so then, as for a chain of decoupled sites, you might think that the spectral form factor was given essentially by the product of the spectral, the sort of the product of the local spectral form factors. So for each chunk of your chain, you would find a spectral form factor that was equal to t, and taking the product of all of these, you would find the overall form factor. And consequently, at early times, you do expect your spectral form factor to shoot up relative to the behavior in a random matrix. Um, at late times, on the other hand, uh, we uh, well, we know in chaotic systems that random matrices are pretty good. Random matrix behavior is pretty good later on. Um, so there, we again expect a spectral form factor equal to t, and for exactly the same reason as before. So your spectral form factor would then be well approximated by a sum over what are now sort of global diagonal orbit pairings. So the outer circle here is the forward orbit, but now it's really the forward orbit of the full many body system in Fox space. And the inner circle is the backward orbit. So maybe a better way to draw this, draw one of these orbit pairings now is as, as follows. Uh, so here X is the horizontal direction and I'm sort of looking side on at my chain. So space time is, uh, so forward space time is the outer cylinder and backward space time is the inner cylinder. And at the left end of the chain, I've paired 12 o'clock of my forward orbit with 12 o'clock of the backward. And I've done the same on the right end of the chain. And so there's a sum over these T global diagonal orbit pairings that gives you a spectral form factor equal to T. Um, so how do you get between these? So intermediate times, what you expect, uh, well, well, okay, at least what is the, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, a picture of domain walls in the orbit pairing. So the idea is that you would be, you should be able to understand your spectrum um, by thinking about the behavior of these domain walls. That is to say, because of the local interactions, one end of your system might be paired in one way and the other end might be paired in the other. So to summarize what I've just been saying now, uh, you should think of the orbit pairing as a local degree of freedom. The spectral form factor uh, is then really given as a sum over all local orbit pairing configurations. And so a nice way to think about it is it's a kind of partition function. So each of your local orbit pairings can take say T values and the spectral form factor is a partition function for these local orbit pairings. And the way you recover random matrix behavior is that the average size of a domain in the orbit pairing grows with time. And the reason this happens is that the, okay, you can think of each domain wall um, in your partition function as contributing some sort of statistical weight. And at late times, the statistical weight of these domain walls decreases. And it decreases sufficiently quickly that the translational entropy of these domain walls cannot overcome them. Um, but okay, so far, this is a nice picture and I've given no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, so I'll first off talk about fingerprints of these domain walls that you might see in numerics. So I'll talk about the, just some numerics that we've done the spectral form factor. So this slide maybe requires a bit of an introduction. 
Uh, so here I calculated the spectral form factor with both periodic and open boundary conditions and uh, averaged over a large number of realizations. So at late times, I've just said that the random matrix behavior, kt equal to t, um, can be understood as a sum over t global diagonal orbit pairings. So the first correction to that random matrix behavior uh, is from configurations of orbit pairing with two domains. If you have two domains in the orbit pairing, then with open boundaries, you can get away with having just one domain wall. Whereas with periodic boundary conditions, you have to have two domain walls. If the sort of statistical weight of one of these domain walls is decreasing with time, then what I'm saying is that with periodic boundary conditions, deviations from random matrix theory are suppressed relative to open. That is to say, more domain walls, more suppression, uh, less likely to see deviations from RMT. And this is exactly what we're seeing in these figures in a pretty striking way. So the darkest, I hit the different lines in the two figures here show different system sizes. The darkest line is 12 sites. And you can see that only for already for just 12 sites, the, deviate, the difference is really pretty striking. And the other thing you notice is that as you're increasing the system size, you see larger and larger deviations from random matrix behavior, which I remind you should just be a linear behavior, spectral form factor equal to T. Um, and the way you understand this is that the translational entropy of a domain wall in 1D goes like L. You can put a translation, you can put a domain wall on any one of your bonds. So this kind of um, picture came out of an exactly, uh, sorry, I should have put the paper reference here. It came out of a exactly solvable model in the large Q limit from another paper from uh, Amos Chan, Andrea Luca and John a couple of years ago. Um, but there was an outstanding question of how, whether you could see this in a generic setting. And even then, in a generic, generic setting, like what I'm showing you here, how you would test it. So just as a reminder, this is a spin half chain acted on by random four by four matrices. So uh, over the next few slides, I'll explain how to set up this picture, how to study the pairing domains and how to extract properties of the domain walls in the generic uh, system with this brickwork geometry. Uh, brickwork is just the kind of, um, what the, it's, a, it's, so I'll go back a long way. When I say brickwork, I mean this kind of picture. Okay, so the way to do it is to set up a transfer matrix for the path of the spins. So this transfer matrix um, will act on sort of space slices. Uh, what I've drawn on the right here is the spectral, what I've drawn on the right here is a kind of circuit representation of the spectral form factor. So in the foreground, what I'm showing is the trace of the evolution operator. So light gray means uh, sort of unconjugated unitaries. Uh, and the convention I'm using here is that the dash lines going out of the top are uh, connected to the dash lines coming back into the, at the bottom of the diagram. So by connecting the sort of uh, top of the diagram to the bottom, I'm, I'm computing a trace of the evolution operator. And in the background, I'm showing the conjugate of this. Um, so the idea is to set up this transfer matrix, not to act in the time direction, as does the evolution operator, but to act in the space direction. But it's acting on the sort of entire path of the spin at a given position which has dimension q to the 4t, which I, I can count up now. So uh, what I'm showing you on the right is time two. Uh, during a single time step, there are two half steps as I was drawing before. Um, on each of these half steps, the spin could be in q different states, in our case two. Um, and so throughout one time step, each spin, yeah, so we have q squared different spin configurations along a given time step. And therefore over a time t, you have q to the 2t. When you take into the back, take into account the backward paths too, you have q to the 40 possible paths of the possible forward and backward paths of the spin. But then maybe the point I'm trying to make here is this transfer matrix is really big and we're going to be caring about late time dynamics. Okay, so how do you build T? Uh, it, maybe it doesn't take a huge amount of imagination to see that you could take one of these unitary matrices and just bend the legs sideways. So you can think of this thing not as a unitary matrix, a unitary matrix acting in the time direction, but as a non-unitary matrix acting in the space direction. So what you then do is you sort of stack these on top of each other and uh, get your transfer matrix. So this is a transfer matrix for time two. 
And this uh, funny thing going on the left is a, it's really just a sort of index shift. And the reason for doing that is so I can use the same transfer matrix on every single time step here. Sorry, every single bond here. So, okay, on the right, what I've drawn is the spectral form factor with open boundary conditions. And that now takes this form. Oh, sorry, actually, the, another very important point here is that the um, each of my bonds, the gate which lives on each of my bonds, uh, well, they're all um, identically distributed, but completely independent. I choose them independent. They're the same through time, but different in space. And because of this, when I average the transfer matrix, the average is the same on every single bond. Now, because the transfer matrix is the same on every bond, the average spectral form factor can be written in terms of powers of the average transfer matrix. This should be contrasted, for example, with the case of translational invariance, where in that case, your spectral form factor would depend on moments of the transfer matrix. So this expression also requires a bit of unpacking. Uh, so these vectors here, BL and BR, these are uh, vectors in a Q to the well, they vectors in a Q to the four T dimensional space, which are there just to encode the boundary conditions on the left and the right boundaries. Uh, with periodic boundary conditions, I would instead be taking the trace of this um, transfer matrix. Okay, uh, are there any questions at this point? No, nope, it seems we're good. Okay, cool. Um, so a few properties of this transfer matrix. Um, so this thing is invariant under time translation of both the forward orbit and the backward orbit. And because there are sort of T different translations you can do for each of them, you end up with T squared blocks of the transfer matrix. And we can label these by frequencies. Uh, well, I call them omega plus and omega minus, and you, these are really related to the forward orbit and the backward orbit. And the main point here is that this transfer matrix has T leading eigenvalues. Um, and one, one in each of uh, these blocks where omega plus is equal to minus omega minus, but maybe that's not so, not so important. Um, so you have T leading eigenvalues. And so the spectral form factor, the expression for which is down here, um, is at large L is controlled basically just by these T leading eigenvalues. And it's these leading eigenvalues and the associated eigenvectors, which are going to encode the local pairing of orbits, which I was sketching in the previous couple of slides. Uh, and this, all of the structure of pairing domains and um, all of the structure of pairing domains is in there. And you can also see the approach to RMT quite clearly from them. Okay. Uh, so next I'll talk about how we can extract some information on this transfer matrix. So, as I've just said, um, information on these domain walls and on these pairing domains is encoded in the average transfer matrix. But this average transfer matrix is huge. It's Q to the 40 by Q to the 40. Uh, so ED is not really going to be an option for large times. Um, well, okay, you can get to T equals five, and that has been done, but again, not really large times. So we have to think about a way we're going to learn something about this transfer matrix. And so the idea is essentially to use a, a kind of twisted boundary condition. So this is the same diagram I put up before, but I'm using it to mean something slightly different here. So our idea is to take the kind of double space time, this trace of the evolution operator and its conjugate, um, and to manually stick the forward orbit on one end of the system to the backward orbit, and do the same on the other end in a different way. So how do we do this? Uh, using the transfer matrix, well, this kind of more abstract picture in terms of the transfer matrix takes this form. So what I've drawn here are, it's the transfer matrix for two bonds here. So I'm thinking about say three sites. Um, and what I've done on the left-hand side of the system is I've tried to glue the forward orbit to the backward orbit at equal times which is what's represented by these dark gray lines connecting the forward and backward paths. On the right side of the system, I've stuck the forward orbit to the backward orbit in a different way. So here, a pairing of paths is really just an index contraction. And this index contraction is represented by a vector in this huge space. 
So what we can do is we can glue the space time together in this way, uh, go to late time as an average. And what we find is the following. Uh, okay, so maybe, uh, so I haven't introduced this notation Z. Z means, um, quote, trace of evolution multiplied by trace of evolution conjugated. And so I'll go through this uh, graph for a moment. So the dashed lines here to start off with correspond to the case where we have un untwisted boundary conditions. So we've sort of grabbed the cylinder in the same way on both ends and the solid lines represent the twist. So for the dashed lines, what we're doing is we're forcing one global orbit pairing. We're forcing the same orbit pairing on one end and the other. And these are exactly what we, these are exactly the, so we're picking, we're picking one of the T global orbit pairings, which will contribute to the spectral form factor at late times. As a reminder, um, the spectral form factor being equal to T is the sum of the T global orbit pairings. Here, we're just picking one for the dashed line. And so it's natural to expect this object to tend to unity at late times. On the other hand, uh, when we have, a twist, as in the solid lines, we're really forcing a domain wall and the orbit pairing into the system. And this is where I think he's a really striking evidence for the domain walls. Uh, because as you increase the system size here, here from three to eight sites, you're seeing that the contribution of this domain wall is increasing. And this, as I mentioned before, is associated with the translational entropy of the domain wall. So, okay, these twisted boundary conditions are a very nice way to demonstrate that there is something beyond the diagonal approximation going on when you have local interactions. Uh, but there's actually a more use to them than just that demonstration. So using these twisted boundary conditions and then um, doing a kind of Fourier transform in the twist, where you, you can, you're actually able to extract the leading eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. And additionally, the overlaps of the leading eigenvectors with the what I've called the diagonal pairings. And the, when I say diagonal pairings, what I mean are those those vectors I was sticking on the ends of my product of transfer matrices to pair forward with backward orbits. So there's the gray lines in the lower left figure here. So um, let's see what we find. So at, late, at large t, we find that the t leading eigenvalues of this transfer matrix are all tending to unity. And consequently, the spectral form factor, which or you could approximate it with periodic boundary conditions as just a sum over these t leading eigenvalues, each to the power of L, will then tend towards T. Uh, and it's actually the deviations, well, the differences between these eigenvalues, which contain information on the domain walls. Uh, so I've plotted them in the lower left figure here. Um, the solid lines here represent the results from our twisted boundary conditions and the subsequent Fourier transform. Uh, the, the open circles are the uh, ED up to T equals five that I advertised before. Uh, and the well, the dotted line is something else that I could talk about. Um, I could talk about uh, if there are questions about it, but it's really a consistency check in this case. So you see that the t leading eigenvalues tend to unity, and this is how random matrix behavior emerges at late times. Well, this is how your picture of multiple domains turns into a picture of one big domain. Uh, on the right hand figure, what I've shown are the overlaps. So these are the overlaps between the leading eigenvalues, sorry, the leading eigenvectors and the paired states defined by our boundary conditions. So there's something to be said here as well. So again, again they're all tending to unity, which is what was actually required for um, the solid line here to decay to zero and for the dashed line to tend to unity. Um, but this is pretty remarkable that we're seeing such a large overlap, right? So at time 20 here, we're talking about vectors in a space of dimension two to the 80, and we're seeing an overlap between them that's about one. So um, although I, I should stress that the, uh, the overlap tending to one does not imply a quality of the eigenvectors. And this is because the transfer matrix is not symmetric or, or emission. And as a consequence of that, its eigenvectors form a biorthogonal set as opposed to an orthogonal one. So we have strong overlap, but that does not imply a quality. Right, okay. Uh, so schematically, this is, uh, oh, sorry, another part to talk about. So um, the spectral form factor here, I've said with periodic boundary conditions uh, could be approximated by a sum over just the T leading eigenvalues, but maybe that's an oversimplification. Um, maybe I should be taking into more taking into account more eigenvalues. Is there something else going on here? So you can conduct, conduct a very stringent test. What you can do is you could extract your T leading, T leading eigenvalues from twisted boundary conditions, 
uh, you can you you can take them to the power of L, sum them over sum them over omega, and ask whether your result is actually equal to the spectral form factor with periodic boundary conditions. And so that's what we've done here. So the solid line here um, is ED. Uh, so I've just uh, done e ED on system sizes up to a size up to twelve sites and averaged. And the dashed lines here are the reconstruction using the T leading eigenvalues. And you can see that the, it's, the agreement is really pretty remarkable. It's on the scale of the numerical errors. And this holds up well up until you get past the Heisenberg time, which is um, Q to the L. So this is the point where you start noticing when you get beyond the um, uh, inverse mean level spacing. So for a system of four sites here, uh, the Heisenberg time is at 16. And it's beyond this point that the subleading eigenvalues of the transfer matrix kick in. Prior to that, the subleading eigenvalues seem to be doing basically nothing. So you really can think of the spectral form factor before the Heisenberg time as a partition function for pairing domains. And information on these pairing domains is encoded in this transfer matrix. OK. Um, so wrapping up this part of the story, before I move on to talk about observables, uh, these are the kind of regimes of the spectrum of a chaotic system with local interactions. So on the horizontal direction, I'm showing the system size and the vertical direction, I'm showing time. So if we, let's stick to and some small system size to begin with. And then when you increase time, you know that you, when you increase time, you're going to pass along here and into this dark gray region. This dark gray region is for times larger than Q to the power of L. So this is where you're probing uh, energy scale is smaller than the mean level spacing, and you see the plateau of the spectral form factor. Uh, in the light gray region, so at slightly earlier times, the spectral form factor is about t. So you just have uh, a sum over these t global diagonal orbit pairings, um, things as you might expect from random matrix theory, and uh, there's nothing particularly new going on. But if you fix time and then go to larger and larger system sizes, you necessarily enter a picture of domains. So the system should be thought of as almost discrete chunks with different um, different orbit pairings in it. And it's the large entropy associated with the freedom in the orbit pairing, which can enhance your spectral form factor well beyond the random matrix value. Okay, and the reason I've, so I've kind of faded out this line between diagonal and domains here. And the reason for that is that um, to get a clean domain picture, you have to go to large enough system sizes that you are washing out those subleading eigenvalues I said weren't doing very much. And there really are a lot of them. This is a Q to the, this is a, I mean, at time 20, as I said, this is a 2 to the 80 by 2 to the 80 matrix. Right, okay. Um, so actually here I will pause for questions for uh, maybe a minute or so. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you do have any questions now, please do ask. So uh, there aren't any questions on the chat. I mean, there's always uh, a bit of a delay between the, the stream and, and the actual talk. So we can, we can wait a few seconds. I actually, okay, sure, sure. I mean, um, I, I was kind of still thinking about it because maybe it's, uh, you know, it's what this slide is talking about, but I, I thought I'd just ask. So when you were mentioning the spectral properties of the transfer function, I mean, you, you are looking at the plots of the eigenvalues. Um, it seemed like the time scale for uh, how those eigenvalues tend to one was the same for different um, sizes. Did I get that? Oh, so for the so going back up to oh, sorry here. Um, sorry, the, I should have been clearer. These aren't different system sizes in that figure. Oh. Um, so no, sorry, I really should have brought that up. Um, so these the different uh, colors here represent. Um, the different sectors. Uh, so okay, okay. the yeah, so the black line here is the and this is this is actually really important. So the omega equal to zero eigenvalue is always greater than one. Um, and so when you go to if you fix t and go to very large L, it's actually just this one leading eigenvalue that's dominating. Um, and then yeah, so for the having having uh, non-zero so okay the 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 other t minus one eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. are subleading but still approaching unity and their approaching unity at late times is necessary for the domain wall tension to be um vanishing okay at late times 
I see. Okay. Oh, I see. Maybe there's there's probably a, a slight caveat there, but maybe not so important right now. Okay. Uh, anything else? Um. No, I mean there aren't any questions in the chat. Um, okay, so, cool. I'll move yeah. on to okay. So next it's next it's observables. All right. Um. So so far I've all I've just been talking about the spectrum. Um. But. So uh, maybe maybe people are more interested in observables. Um, so the if we're going to start talking about um, observables in a many-body system, uh, we should really be thinking about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So this is really the standard prediction for the behavior of local observables. Um, and the I guess in this most basic form, you'd say that the expectation values of observables in eigenstates should be equal to their thermal averages. Now in a Floquet system. You don't have a notion of high and low energy. Uh, so all of your eigenstates are the, sort of at the same temperature. And consequently, uh, taking two different eigenstates, N and M, the, the expectation values of these of the observable tor in these different eigenstates should be sort of statistically equivalent. There's, it's not like one is a high energy or a low energy state. And okay, so maybe the most okay, okay one of the, a very dramatic prediction of what of this picture of local orbit pairing I've described is that um, nearby eigenstates are actually much more similar than you would expect from ETH, and that they become more and more similar the larger the system sizes you go to. Uh, so what do I mean by more similar? What I mean is that there are gonna be, there are correlations between the expectation values of local observables. So if I define this correlator here, then uh, in the time domain, I can instead look at this kind of form factor. So it's like the spectral form factor, but I've thrown my operator here. So Tor I'm thinking of is just some single site emission operator. Um, now the, the important point is that this form factor, trace of Tor evolution mod squared, uh, has the same trace structure as the spectral form factor away from the operator. And consequently, um, you have freedom in the local orbit pairing away from that site. Uh, okay, more formally, um, you can calculate it with the same transfer matrix. And so you'll notice the deviations of the eigenvalues of that transfer matrix from unity. Fixing T and going to large L, this thing will grow exponentially. Okay, so I'm now gonna say uh, the same sort of thing, but much more dryly, so I can define an object I've actually plotted. Um, okay, so let's take this kind of uh, correlator of diagonal matrix elements and average it over a basis uh, for observables. So this sum over J is a sum over a kind of orthogonal basis of observables. Um, and they're all, crucially, they're all traceless here. Uh, so, okay, and this correlator obeys this kind of sum rule. And this is an important thing to keep in mind when you're trying to parameterize the deviations from random matrix theory or ETH that you would expect. Okay, uh, so now in random matrix theory, or just so taking N and M to be random vectors, and orthogonal and complex, et cetera, um, you would expect this to be your correlator. So for n not equal to m, this thing is exponentially small in system size. Uh, and you can check that this thing obeys the sum rule above. Sam? Uh-huh. Uh, so these, I mean, this uh, result that you're showing here, so does that depend on the observer being local? Uh, right, so yeah, this is uh, for single site observables. So that 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 um, result that you're giving when you say uh, you average over random orthonormal vectors, that mm -hmm. um, depends on the tau's being uh, like single site boundaries, for example. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's like a slightly modified version of this expression when you have um, like multi site observables. Okay, I I guess. My, my question is, I mean, wouldn't one be able to write this? So when you when you average over random orthonormal, I mean, the vectors themselves are non-local, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. You know, are hard random vectors. So I guess, um, you know, it's a question, I, would, I, I have never really done this, but um, I wonder how the averaging over hard random, the, these hard random vectors sees the local structure of the operator. Right, because oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So no. Okay. That's a good question. Um, okay. So I uh, kind of more kind of mechanically. 
uh, you take your you can take a bunch take your um, random vectors, and you can label the components of these vectors with some q to the l valued label. Uh, so you can perform your average, and then you can rewrite that label uh, in a kind of uh, is a kind of tensor product structure. So you can, and then what you do is you sum over you sum over the indices at all sites away from the insertion of the operator. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. No problem. Um, okay. So. Right. Okay. So that's random orthogonal vectors, um, and I've mentioned this sum rule above. More generally, you you could you could write this correlator in this form here, where I've introduced this this thing R N M. Uh, so R and M for now are just a bunch of numbers, uh, and some rule is requiring that the average of R and M along any row or any column is minus one. And okay, so that's maybe the important number to keep in mind. Uh, random matrix theory, um, which I think is effectively, which I believe is effectively the same as the ETH for a Floch A problem, um, is telling you that this number should be minus one after averaging. And because we're thinking about a chaotic system here, we don't have any um, sort of good quantum numbers aside from the quasi energy. And so after averaging, you might expect that these coefficients R and M depend only on the quasi energy difference between the two eigenstates N and M. Okay, so what do we see in practice? Um, so this is numerics with system sizes shown on the legend. This is eight, 10, 12, and 14 sites. Um, calculating R for a system with open boundary conditions where the deviations are a little bit more dramatic. Um, so yeah, the deviations from ETH, I think are really pretty striking. You'd expect this number to be minus one in random matrix theory. And, and here we're seeing uh, even at the smallest quasi-energy separations where you'd expect ETH to be most appropriate, we're seeing about 150. Um, okay, so before, but, okay, so before I was telling you that uh, the deviations in the spectral form factor are all early times. So how can it be that we're now seeing a Fourier transform that gives us a huge peak at small frequency? Uh, so the way to think about this is we're going back to the plot of the eigenvalues. So it's this late time, this slow late, okay, relatively quick, but still uh, not sharp, late time decay of the eigenvalues uh, that Fourier transforms to give you this low frequency peak. So think Fourier transform your exponential, you get a Lorentzian. It's that kind of behavior going on here. And so, yeah, this is what really one of our key results. Um, the the uh, nearby eigenstates are more similar than you would expect. But I should also stress that this R is in units of the ETH value. So the actual correlator you would see is like R over Q to the power of 2L. So this is an enhancement relative to ETH, but uh, one, but the growth with L is much slower than the decay of Q to the 2L. And that scaling is really important to see this behavior. Right, okay, um, so this brings me to the conclusions. So um, I've talked about how the diagonal approximation has to be extend, has to be modified in extended systems. And this leads you to a picture of pairing domains. I've shown you how you can set up this picture of pairing domains using, uh, using this average transfer matrix. Um, study this transfer matrix using the twisted boundary conditions I mentioned before um, and extract, extract its leading spectral properties. And I've shown that this picture of pairing domains uh, has some pretty strong consequences for local observables and uh, what seems to be a divergent correction to the ETH in the thermodynamic limit. So yeah, uh, thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, Sam, for a great talk. Um, all right, Let's see what we have. Can uh, I already ask a question in the meanwhile? Sure, sure. So here you have these corrections on ETH in these circuit models. Do you expect similar corrections if we look at ETH just in Hamiltonian local models? Yeah, so I, I, I obviously I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, so the and, and how you've run through the construction. So it does seem for a, if you think about a Hamiltonian problem that's with a cut in the middle of it, so it's really just two systems separated, then at late times, you again expect your spectral form factor to be T in each one of your decoupled halves of your system, or at least to have this ramp behavior. And so if you, uh, 
sort of very weakly connect these things back together. You might expect then a crossover between the T squared early times where it behaves as a decoupled system and T at late times when it behaves as a, as a glued together system. Mm -hmm. What seems to be the key question there is whether uh, you can, whether the early time peak that you see in the spectral form factor of a Hamiltonian extends to later times than you could possibly see uh, the, the properties of pairing domains. Thanks. Uh, not, right. not quite ready, but a different question is, what would happen if you introduce uh, conservation laws in these systems? Because you mentioned that you have these user certain models which don't have the usual local con conservation of energy in Hamiltonian models. But what would happen I, if you uh, reintroduce some conservation laws here? So that's a good question and something we actually thought about a bit. Um, so the Okay, so if you introduce a conservation law, the so the time for the spectral form factor to approach its sort of RMT or a godic value, um, you can think of as kind of the time to spread over the relevant part of the Fox space. Now, if you have a conservation law, that time scale becomes something like it becomes diffusive. So you have a time scale going as L squared associated with the diffusion of your charge density over the system. Um, now, in the models I've talked about so far, just going back up a bit. Um, the time scale at which the time scale at which uh, sort of domains go away and you see um, you enter the diagonal regime, the t isn't going as L squared. It's much more slow than that. Uh, so if, if, for example, the domain wall, the weight of a domain wall was, exp was decaying exponentially in time, then you would find that domain walls are basically all gone by a time that's logarithmic in system size. So although the time scale at which domains are playing a role diverges with system size. Um, so does the time scale associated with the diffusing charge density, and that diverges much faster. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's very clear. All right. So, um, while we wait to see if uh, there is perhaps uh, some question in the chat uh, where people are, you know, thanking you for the talk and, and, and saying congratulations. Um, so, you know, you were mentioning, uh, or you were describing these deviations from ETH in terms of um, this function R. I, I guess just to clarify, maybe I got a bit lost. I mean, with this, so this, I mean, you see the deviations in this uh, correlation function. I mean, the correlations between um, local observables between different eigenstates, right? So would that in the in the dynamics of the thermalization itself, would that uh, manifest itself in like large fluctuations in time from the equilibrium value? Is that correct? Right, okay. So um so one play okay so if we're thinking about the dynamic so it's the diagonal matrix elements are definitely going to be basically controlling the behavior of time average quantities. Right. Um whether we can understand, well, yeah, whether it has any effect on large deviations is not super is not so clear to me. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 this is really an effect that would affect time average values, as far as I can see. I see. All right. All right. I think. Uh, that it's uh, that is it. We don't have any any more questions. Um, so that would conclude the seminar. Thank you, Sam, uh, very much for for giving the talk. Um, we are going to be back next week, as usual. And next week we'll have uh, the speaker will be Adolfo del Campo from the Nostia International Physics Center, uh, who will be talking about quantum chaos uh, versus decoherence. So uh, looking forward to that and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Great. Thanks again for having me and thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>